let's talk about chapter nine, processing finished products of steel. Some of the processes that we use for cold working steel into what we call finished products are going to be rolling, forming, cutting and grinding, which is just machining, right? Joining, which is our welding, brazing, and soldering processes, and corrosion prevention, which will be our you know coatings, galvanized coatings, zinc, black oxide, paint, whatever it may be. For the most part, we're just going to focus on the metallurgical aspects of this, okay? So the cold working and the resultant grain structure. Cold rolling is going to occur below a material's recrystallization temperature. We can find this with our binary phase diagrams, which we'll talk about next chapter, or just by looking in Machinery's handbook. This is usually going to be at room temperature. Okay, There's no reason to heat up a metal to 900 degrees when its recrystallization temperature might be 1200 degrees. Right? You just leave it at room temperature and you're good to go. The grains and cold worked metals are going to deform permanently. Right? They're going to be squished and they're not coming back to their original shape. Whereas in hot working, the grains will be temporarily changed in size and shape and then if they keep if you keep them hot, they'll grow back to their normal size and shape. Cold worked metals are going to depending on the forces you're applying, the mechanical forces, they're going to be smaller and they're going to be a different shape. So this is going to give you some directional strength in one direction or the other. The dislocation tangles will develop in these deformed grains. Okay, they're going to be a, a whole mess and it actually makes them stronger because it's more difficult for the grains to slide by each other. But because it's more difficult for the grains to slide by each other, they're going to be more brittle. Okay, so whenever you cold work something, it's going to be slightly in tension. Okay, there's going to be a, a little internal tension in there. It's going to increase the strength but it's going to decrease your duct ductility, uh, elongation, malleability, all of that. Steel under 3 16 of an inch thick is usually going to be cold rolled. The reason being hot rolled steel will develop mill scale and this can adversely affect your dimensional accuracy and any coatings you might want to put on it. Mill scale is developed during the hot working process. Whenever steel is red hot, the outside skin is going to oxidize, right? It's going to suck up oxygen, and that's what creates that iron oxide coating, which we call mill scale, right? The mill scale can't be too terribly accurately controlled, so you're always going to have some dimensional variation with hot worked steel. The way foundries remove the mill scale is with pickling. Pickling uses an extremely terrifying strong acid, right? They, they dump the material in there and the acid literally eats away the mill scale before the steel goes through whatever process it's going to go through. It's important to remember the pickling uh, activates the metal. We won't we'll get too much into it, but essentially metal that's been pickled is going to rust really, really quickly when it's exposed to air because it had that protective coating of iron oxide taken away, right? So we're going to apply oil to the outside of cold worked metals as soon as they come out of their processes. So I'm sure you know when you go buy cold rolled steel, it always has a thin film of oil on it. The reason is to protect it from the atmosphere so that it doesn't oxidize. So it's just something you want to keep in mind. You want to, if you have to weld it, you want to wipe that oil off with some kind of solvent. Or if you're going to paint it, you want to get that oil off with some kind of solvent. Cold rolled steel typically has tighter dimensional tolerances than the same size of hot rolled steel. You can look this up. You can expect better tolerances. Uh, cold rolled steel, as we said before, is going to be a little bit stronger. It's preferred for many applications where you need that extra strength. But because the grains have been elongated in a particular direction, it's going to respond adversely to machining in some situations. So if you remember, all metals have a limit of how much they can be 
cold worked. You can see this on charts and tables as the percent elongation or the percent reduction. So let's have a mystery material that has a 40% you know, reduction. If you have an inch of it, you can reduce it by 400 thou and it won't rupture, right? If you wanted to reduce it more than that, you couldn't, right? That's the limit of the reduction you can apply. The way we get around this when we're cold working is something called a process anneal. A process anneal only differs from a full anneal in that it's typically done in between uh, rolling or forming operations. So say we have an inch billet of material, we want to reduce it to sheet metal, so 20 thou or something. We're going to squish it, you know, maybe 25% once, process anneal it, squish it another 25%, uh, process anneal, and just keep doing that until we get it down to the thickness we want. The process anneal is just going to bring those grains back up to size. It'll reduce the tension in the material so that we can apply that reduction again. For steels, process anneals are typically going to be above 1200 degrees. Uh, they can be a little hotter. It's not a big deal, but you don't want to go too hot. Otherwise, you're just using up your oven uh, fuel for no reason. One important thing with cold worked metals is whenever you're annealing or heat treating of any kind, you want to make sure oxygen cannot get into the uh, furnace, right? Just like we've talked about before, whenever oxygen touches hot metal, it's going to oxidize and that's going to give us that mill scale that we don't want. The term for this is something called a bright anneal. What they do is fill the oven or furnace with argon or helium or some kind of inert gas to keep that oxygen out of there. So the idea is you put a bright shiny piece of metal in, you get a bright shiny piece of metal out. The ovens used for annealing can be a typical batch oven where you just take parts, you put them in, you pull them out like a pizza oven, right? Or for larger uh, operations, they can be a continuous oven. So it goes from one roll straight through an, uh, an oven area like a conveyor belt and then goes right into another roll without somebody having to pick the material up and move it around. Let's talk a little bit about forming sheet. So these are going to be your typical sheet metal practices. So your press break or your bar folder, uh, ring roller, things like that. Okay. The idea is when you order your material, they come in different grades as to how much they've been annealed. So they have something called dead soft, which is as uh, soft and ductile as the material can be. So it just depends how much you're going to cold work it as to what you need to order. If you order a material that's been heat treated and quenched, right, it's going to be too hard and strong to form at all. So typically the sheets are annealed before they're uh, formed. Uh, the press break is one of the primary uh, machines we use for this. They use an assortment of dies to press the material into the shape you want. It could be a right angle or a curve or all sorts of compound shapes are available in press breaks. Important thing to remember is that when you're bending metal, the metal is in tension and compression at the same time. Okay, so if you think of a piece of metal that's being bent, the inside corner is going to be compression and the outside bend is going to be in tension. The place, if you imagine in the middle of the material where it's neither tension or a compression is known as the neutral axis. Another process used for sheet metal is stretching. You see this with expanded sheet, you know, you uh, cut little slits into a piece of sheet metal and you pull it apart to get that uh, diamond shaped with sheet metal with little holes in it. Drawing is when you have flat sheet and it's pulled through a die, but it doesn't change in thickness. Whereas ironing forces material through a die and a wedge and it squishes it down and changes its thickness as it's being drawn. This is what they use to make soda cans, right? They have a very uh, uniform thickness. They're very thin and very strong because they've been cold work to a certain extent. The last thing I want to talk about in this section is cold forging. So cold forging is going to use the same basic techniques as hot forging, but the material is going to be at room temperature. So you're going to get that directional 
grain structure, right? So if you have a, a gear blank or the bolt of a head, you're going to get the grains following where you need the strength instead of uh, being all over the place, equiax like a casting, or being cut off as if it was machined. Some common uses for cold forging are bolt heads, this is called cold upsetting, and screw threads are typically rolled when the material's at room temperature. This gives them greater strength, but less ductility than something that's been machined or cast.